This week on Jerusalem Dateline, 20 years after a deadly terror attack, Palestinian accomplices get a pay raise and a major victory against terrorism with the killing of al-Qaeda's leader. Plus, Ukrainian orphan refugees in Israel get a surprise visit from home. And a 2,000-year-old silver coin brings the past to life. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl filling in for Chris Mitchell. 20 years ago, a suicide bomber killed nine people and wounded dozens in an attack at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. As Chris Mitchell reports, the accomplices of that attack just got a pay raise. The bombing took place at the Frank Sinatra cafeteria at Hebrew University on July 31, 2002. It came in the middle of what was called the Second Intifada, a four-year-long terror campaign against Israelis. The IDF arrested those responsible, some who had been in prison for 20 years. Here we're talking about nine people murdered, over 80 injured. Five of those murdered were actually American citizens. And now the PA is literally paying additional rewards to those terrorists. Maurice Hirsch of the Palestinian Media Watch explains the Palestinian Authority law, which standardizes payments to terrorists. And sets a pay scale, which goes up, where the salary goes up every period of time on an automatic basis. So one of those increments is when you have served 20 years in jail, you then get a 14 and a bit percent um, pay rise and your salary goes up. Israel also passed its own anti-terror law in 2018. That reduces the amount of tax revenue they return to the PA that's equal to the money the Palestinian Authority pays terrorists in jail. Just days ago, they stopped payment of more than $170 million to the PA. But the process of paying money to terrorists, known as pay to slay, is deeply embedded in the Palestinian Authority. I cannot impress upon you how deeply suited and rooted this entire policy is. If, as Mahmoud Abbas has repeatedly said, if there's only one penny left in the coffers of the Palestinian Authority, he will pay it to terrorists. Four years ago, the U.S. Congress passed the Taylor Force Act to stop USAID to the Palestinians from going to pay terrorists. The Palestinian Authority just don't care. While they constantly say that America is failing the Palestinians by not providing them with aid, really all they have to do is stop paying terrorists, stop rewarding the murderers of American citizens, and they'll be able to get the money. But their positive choice is again to prioritize rewarding terrorists, even over receiving aid from America. The Biden administration has resumed aid to the PA after the Trump administration cut their funding. While it doesn't go directly to pay terrorists, Hirsch believes it can help them indirectly. The fungibility of money is clear once the U.S. steps in, even really not in breach necessarily of Taylor Force, but in breach of at least the spirit of Taylor Force and takes over these projects and the funding of these projects from the Palestinian Authority, it frees up the PA's money to, to keep on rewarding the terrorists and pay hundreds of millions of dollars um, in those rewards. Hirsch says the world needs to wake up to how the PA keeps alive this perpetuation of terrorism. Probably the most poisonous idea in affecting peace between Israelis and Palestinians at the moment is the payment of these rewards to terrorists. The international community must get together, must implore the Palestinian Authority to abolish this policy and condition all aid to the PA on abolishing this policy. The U.S. killing of al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawari is a major victory in the war against terrorism, while also raising more questions about the terrorist group and Afghanistan. CBN News correspondent Brody Carter has that story. Nearly 3,000 people were murdered in the terror attacks on 9-11. 21 years later, the U.S. government is still hunting those responsible. No matter how long it takes, no matter where you hide, if you are a threat to our people, the United States will find you and take you out. Sunday, the man who led al-Qaeda following Osama bin Laden's death in 2011 died in a drone strike ordered by President Biden. He made videos, including in recent weeks, calling for his followers to attack the United States and our allies. 
now justice has been delivered. One of the fascinating things about Ayman al-Zawahiri is that he hails from one of the most prominent families in Egypt. As a matter of fact, before he devoted his life to terrorism, he worked for years as a medical doctor and even worked with children. Eric Stackelbeck, terror analyst and host of The Watchmen, says al-Zawahiri then transitioned to the world of jihad. His fingerprints were on attacks including the 2000 bombing of the USS Cole, which killed 17 sailors and bombing U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, killing more than 200 and wounding thousands. This strike inside Afghanistan comes a year after the chaotic U.S. retreat from the country. My fellow Americans, the war in Afghanistan is now over. Still, analysts like Stackelbeck worry our absence left a vacuum likely filled by various terror groups. The terror threat is not over because of that hasty withdrawal will once again become a terror safe haven is very real. As U.S. intelligence keeps a watchful eye on the region, many wonder what's next. Who is the successor to Ayman al-Zawahiri? Who is the next jihadi to lead al-Qaeda? And right now the prime candidate appears to be a guy by the name of Saif al-Adel. Now, like Zawahiri, he is an Egyptian, but the interesting wrinkle here is that he currently lives in Iran. The U.S. and other world powers are back in Vienna for more negotiations over Iran's nuclear program. However, the talks that have gone on for more than a year show little promise of an agreement. While the talks began once more in Vienna on August 4th, one of the U.S. chief negotiators said his expectations are in check. These talks follow the failure of earlier negotiations in Doha, Qatar. Going to Vienna, Iran denied it had abandoned its precondition to a deal on the U.S. taking its Revolutionary Guard Corps off the list of terror organizations. The resumption of talks comes after one top Iranian official said last month that they'll do what they want regarding a nuclear bomb. Nevertheless, if we ever want to do this, nobody will be able to stop us, of course. They themselves know this. Iran is now just one step away from enriching weapons-grade uranium. It shouldn't be a surprise uh, to anybody. I think that uh, all intelligence uh, agencies agree that they are progressing, progressing fast. Middle East expert Professor Ephraim Inbar told CBN News when it comes to negotiating, the U.S. and the West are not in the same league with Iran. Iranians uh, are very good at uh, negotiating. They have uh, a bazaar. In, uh, in Tehran, and they know how to negotiate. In contrast, you know, the mentality of uh, the United States is to go to a department store with fixed prices. That's a huge difference in mentality. All the talks for the past two decades uh, produced only further Iranian progress. Inbar believes strength and force are the language spoken in the Middle East. And uh, diplomacy has its limits. Therefore, what is left is only uh, the use of brute force. In the Middle East, this is part and parcel of the rules of the game. This is one tool at the disposal of uh, political leaders. And uh, in this case, I think it is a pity that it was not implemented before. Coming up, an organization whose goal is advancing the human right to freedom of thought, conscious religion or belief for all people worldwide. <music> Tina Ramirez is founder and president of Hardwired Global, an organization dedicated to advancing the human right to freedom of thought, conscious religion or belief for all people worldwide. CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell talked with Ramirez in Jerusalem following her recent trip to Iraq. Well, Tina Ramirez from Hardwired, uh, thanks for joining us here at CBN News. It's great to be with you, Chris. Yeah. Thank you for having me. You're here in Jerusalem now, but you just came from Iraq. Uh, tell us what, what it's like now. We've been there many years ago when ISIS had risen and taken over many parts of uh, northern Iraq and Syria as well. Tell us what it's like now. Yeah, going from a few years ago where you saw such devastation and just inhumanity with ISIS demolishing so many holy sites and just destroying the population to see now signs of hope 
has been remarkable. So I was there working with teachers in Mosul and the Nineveh Plains, helping them teach religious freedom in their schools to restore a sense of peace and of freedom and dignity to the people that had lost it. Yeah, because yeah, years ago it was yeah. anything but mm -hmm. free and... It was, and, and I've saw, I saw churches that are being restored, and there's this hope that the, the Christians will come back, but you'll never have the population of Christians there that you did in the past. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just so many of them have moved on and gone to different countries, and the same with other communities. But, but the restoration is taking place. It is more free to go into parts of Mosul and the Nineveh Plains, and to see that restoration is hopeful for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in Mosul a long time ago, and mm -hmm. uh, it was almost surreal, the devastation mm -hmm. at the time. Tell us yeah. what it's like now. So when you go into certain churches, I mean, historic churches from third, fourth century, you know, onward, and imagine it just the, and the bombs that you can see that have come through and just absolutely decimated it, they're now being built up and restored. Uh, places that ISIS had held court in they have been completely restored. And so it's fascinating to see. But in some of the churches, they can't, they can't restore parts of the wall. So in the Mar Benham and the Mar Sarah monasteries that I've written about, about in my book on Iraq, you, you can't even replace the crosses and the crucifixes that have been taken off of everything by ISIS because they were, they were made into stone and so they don't, mm. have the, they don't have the ability to restore some of those things. So if there's somebody out there that knows how, I'm sure they would love it. But, yeah. but there's, so there's, you still see the remnants of what Daesh left, but, but there is hope because there is that restoration taking place and people coming back. Yeah, uh, and tell us why you were there and tell us about your organization. Yeah. Hardwired. So my organization is Hardwired Global, and we believe that everyone is hardwired to be free, that it's ingrained in us, and our most fundamental freedom is our freedom to worship and to our freedom of conscience. And so we go into countries where they don't have a culture of freedom of conscience and religion and help them build that from the ground up. And uh, usually that's through education systems, but also through the top down, through helping local leaders change their laws and policies to really embrace religious freedom and other human rights as part of the culture. And so in Iraq, we've had an opportunity through the Directorate of Education. So the official government of education in Mosul and the Nineveh Plains has given us full permission to train all of their teachers in religious freedom and human rights, to put it into the curriculum and to have schools learn a different way, not what they were taught from ISIS, which was to hate and kill people, but to embrace the freedom and the dignity of people that believe differently from them. And so now in schools across Mosul and the Nineveh, in the Nineveh Plains, kids are learning this different way, and it's powerful to see what is taking place there. And how is it being received? It's great. I mean, for the first time, the government actually came and met us in Erbil, and the government directorate and told us, you have our full support. We're going, we want this in all of our schools, even the government of Kurdistan, uh, the director of religious affairs there who I met with said, we want this with all of our teachers in, in Kurdistan. So there's this, there's this desire for a different way because of of the horrors that they saw under Daesh. Up next, Ukrainian orphans sheltering in Israel get a happy surprise visit from home. We have some good news this week. Last week we told you about 10 orphans promise workers who were kidnapped in Ukraine. Well, they've been set free, unharmed. Praise God and thank you for your prayers. Meanwhile, as the Russian war against Ukraine drags on, there are other positive stories too, especially for those getting away from the front lines. CBN News revisited a group of orphans brought to Israel by their rabbi about five months ago. Life is good for them in Israel, despite being homesick. For these Ukrainian Jewish refugees, this joyful reunion outside Jerusalem with their teacher and friend Elena Tabachenko was a surprise. We haven't seen one another for five months, and this is really a very long time. It's such a joy that we were able to meet again. It's a great day because uh, I didn't see my primary school teacher. I really left her for a lot of time, and I can't control my emotions. Tabachinko was in Israel as part of a program that introduces international teachers to Israel. We're talking about a group of teachers from Ukraine, Latvia and Estonia, together with a group of teachers from South America and from France. They came here to learn about JNF and about Israel, about Zionism, which went from the north all the way to the south. Shlomo Benheim helped put together the surprise reunion. 
And we found out there's among the teachers from Ukraine, there's a teacher that didn't see her students the last half a year because they flee from the war. We decided to host them here. And the children weren't the only ones surprised. It was Tabachenko's birthday and a friend and fellow teacher had a blessing for her. We want to wish you good health. May each day bring you only joy and happiness. May your family, your children only bring you joy. May there be peace in our land. A great joy and probably one of the biggest gifts for a teacher who is far away from her students is to meet the children, the parents and the colleagues on my birthday. I was so touched by the way I and all of us were received here today because the same way we were received, Israel receives everyone who comes to the country. When Russia first attacked Ukraine, Rabbi Shlomo Wilhelm and his wife Esther fled the country with about 150 children, staff, and parents. They were brought to Nes Harim, a place where youth groups and others come to hike and enjoy nature. Nes Harim, it means miracle in the mountains, and this place has certainly been that miracle for the 150 Ukrainians that fled the war back home. We are very happy here. It is a very calm, quiet place, nice people. And thanks, thanks to Kakao that they help us a lot. It's an amazing place where we feel very, very well. Yes, but now we have to decide what to do uh, in our future. Gilly Maimon is the manager of the Nes Harim Field School. We are really trying to give them the best feeling possible. We are really taking care of them. We have a connection. We really became a family together, but in the end, it's not their home. It's not their routine. They are really trying to go forward and to live in the midst of this. But yes, they are homesick, something that proves they are missing their real lives. For now, the plan for these refugees is to stay in Israel for a year. But whether or not they stay, their hope and dream is for peace in Ukraine. Still ahead, a 2,000-year-old silver coin found by an 11-year-old girl brings the past to life. Thank you for watching Jerusalem Dayline. We're committed to providing you with unbiased reporting from the Holy Land. Through weekly broadcasts, podcasts, and online media, our vision is to reach millions around the globe with the true story of what's happening in Israel and the Middle East, all from a biblical and prophetic perspective. This is a big vision and is only made possible by the generous support of people like you. Call us toll free at 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash Jerusalem Dateline and make a donation that will help spread the light of truth about Israel throughout the world. Here's a story we did some months ago about an 11-year-old girl who made a significant archaeological find in Israel. And as Chris Mitchell tells us, that discovery reveals more of what life was like in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. In the Emek Zurim Park, visitors can sift through debris from the ongoing excavation in the City of David. That's where Liel Krudekop found a rare silver coin from the time of the Second Temple. It feels something not normal. And I um, go to their archaeologic was there, and he cleaned it a little bit, and then he told me, and for my family, that's a silver coin. At first, Liel's father thought they should throw it away. Actually, it didn't look like a coin, so I was thinking to myself, this is some kind of stone, and actually I told to the girls, put it in the garbage can, but they insisted that this is a coin, and they took the coin to the archaeologist that was on the site, and he confirmed that this is indeed a coin. I was very excited, and it's like some happy feel because somebody touched it before 2,000 years and right now I'm touched. This is a very rare find. Together with this silver coin, we know from the archaeological documentation only 30 other silver coins from the rebellion. The coin has two Hebrew inscriptions. We can see here the words in ancient Hebrew, Shekel Israel, and a second line with two Hebrew letters, Shin Bet, which means the second year of the rebellion against the Romans. 
67 8 AD. On the other side of the coin, we have another inscription in ancient Hebrew, which says, Le'erushalayim HaKdusha, to Holy Jerusalem. Archaeologists believe the high priest in the temple wanted the coin to help pay for the revolt against the Romans. Coins were minted uh, in order to emphasize independence of certain communities. So the Jews that uh, rebelled against the Romans wanted to emphasize that they are independent. The Hebrew wording on the coin harkens back to the first temple for a reason. To the time of King David and his son King Solomon. The Jews wanted to emphasize their connection to the great kingdom of Israel led by King David. They missed it. They wanted their kingdom to be as large as King David's kingdom. The coin came from a layer of debris dating to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. I'm standing on the remains of uh, the ancient pilgrimage road that led Jews from all over the world to the temple itself. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the street itself, all the structures that stood on both sides of this street collapsed into one pile. To Levy, the discovery is like traveling back in time. To hold this silver coin is like going back 2,000 years ago and actually touching the common, the daily life of the people that lived in Jerusalem. Liel's mother sees it as more proof of Jewish life in Jerusalem. It tells a lot about the history, about the people that lived here, about everything, uh, about the history of this place, of Jerusalem, and the meaning of this place to us, to, to the Israelis, to the Jewish people. So yes, it means a lot. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blasts so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.